No, but but um, actually, it wasn't. It was just more material. I mean, there was a couple things I wanted to throw in. Uh, one was really a kind of a controversial question having to do with the, the question of blood quantum. And, and I'd love Angela to actually uh, talk about this as well. And that, that is that, you know, Cheryl deals with this question of blood quantum um, when it comes to, like, you know, the question of blackness and, and whiteness. That is, you know, uh, those people who uh, are phenotypically white, right? But then, you know, something gets revealed where they're not pure. Uh, now, we have this other issue in the 1990s. There was a big debate, and Angela knows this better than I do, a huge debate, um, which really goes back to the post-World War II period, but it really explodes around the question of whether or not uh, uh, tribes are to, de be, to be defined by blood quantum, and that had um, implications for property rights, particularly in terms of two, 2007, later with the, the Cherokee freedmen. And so this throws an interesting question because the, the case that um, Cheryl raises is the, the Mashpee uh, case, which is about whether or not the courts could even identify and recognize, willing to recognize um, not just sovereignty, but the actual existence of a tribe. And here you got a situation where people are, through this debate around the question of blood quantum, being excluded around the question of property. And this is another way of thinking about redness as a kind of reproduction of whiteness depending on who you are. But it only affects certain tribes in which the so-called you know, civil, five civilized tribes, in which whiteness becomes part of what defines civilization. So there's all these different levels that are operating there, and I just want to throw that out, um, given the current debates. And and finally, just I had some stuff about um, about Bill Clinton, and the Clinton administration, which I speak you 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 know. <laughs> but this is all stuff that everyone in the room knows. Um, just how how much well, one of the brilliant things about um, uh, many brilliant things about Cheryl's article is that she, you know, at a time when people are beginning to blame George Bush one and Reagan for a rollback on, on the firm of action, um, you know, we have Clinton elected with this promise. And, you know, part of what happens is, well, the first thing he does is create this, um, uh, this commission to look at the question of race, right? And which doesn't produce anything. I mean, John Hope Franklin gets a gig um, in Rice's report, uh, which is tragic because he had great ideas which really weren't paid attention to. Um, but it was also under Clinton where that report, it's kind of shelved, uh, and it was under Clinton that you have, like in the Hopwood case, and you have the, um, uh, not to say that he's to blame, but it's under his watch that you not only have a roll, continued rollback, but also a political um, calculus. That is, uh, lukewarm support for any form of action uh, because it, you know, this idea of eliminating minority set asides and quotas because white voters believe they were unfair. Um, and under his watch, you have the Violent Crime and Control Law Enforcement Act, you have the, you know, um, so called welfare reform. You have so many. Um, acts of, of legislation that his administration supported as right-wing Democrats, right? Although, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. And, and that advance the war on drugs, that advance a kind of dispossession that actually lead to, I think, the further reinforcement of white property rights. And part of the reinforcement and protection of white property rights is the further reduction in value of non-white bodies, I mean, uh, you know, and, and that's, a, this, that's a whole different thing. I mean, th there are other things we could talk about, but I'll just leave it there. Uh, any other comments from the panel or questions from the floor? No. with intersectionality and white women. And uh, white women being the largest group benefiting from a permanent mm -hmm. action. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so just, just um, any thoughts about white womanhood as a property and how um, 
what, what is that doing in terms of a certain silence, in terms of uh, recent affirmative action topics, as opposed to the very vocal um, National Organization of Women um, voices decades ago in terms of being champions for affirmative action and then so, this kind of sudden silence. So whiteness is property, white woman is property, inter white female intersectionality. Somehow I think that's... For me, huh? I, I, <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but... <laughs> um, well, I, I, so thank you for the, for the question. Um, and uh, I, I will start with the preface that it's, it's after midnight for me, so I won't stay with anything that I say now, so don't hold me to it. <laughs> Um, but quite honestly, the, the way I've been thinking about um, white women and intersectionality and um, their power and privilege right now actually is undergoing a, a, a revolution in part because of what's happening on the other side of that, which is my brother's keeper. So I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the availability of and the responsiveness to um, the intersectional erasure of women in co of color in this post-racial moment. Um, and so in, in some ways, it, it's, it's prompting me to think about um, having, a, um, I won't call it letting go, but I will call it there are some moments where you have to look at where your allies are in a particular moment. Mm -hmm. And I have to be honest and say that at this particular moment, um, the anti-racist civil rights uh, establishment is perfectly lined up behind a neoliberal post-racial um, agenda that's all about in, um, individual cultural blame and responsibility. Um, and, and, and so that's as far away from the project around whiteness as property as you could possibly think about. And that's where the civil rights constituency is. And I think one of the reasons that they are there is that they never did deal effectively with patriarchy. So patriarchy is the door through which um, this deeply conservative um, a frame that says no matter how bad your school is, no matter how bad your neighborhood is, no matter how bad your job prospects are, mm -hmm. put on a tie, pull up your pants, and you can make something of yourself. That whole frame is partly made possible because we've never fully contested, not just structural, because a lot of people who have a structural frame still buy into right. this. What they are uh, endorsing and holding up is the idea that only a family that's patriarchal in its formation has the, has the ability to complain um, about what, where we're living and, and how we're living. So I have to say, at this moment, um, the feminist organizations are more responsive to the problem than the civil rights are. Now, now what we think of that and what happens when we shift it again and we're back to traditional race issues, I, I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not riding herd like I used to at this particular moment. I don't know if that's responsive at, at all, but that's where my thinking is at night. <laughs> Here's another non-response. Um, okay, so my white female students, the ones that don't take McKinnon's course, um, which many of them do, but those other ones, they won't say the F word, mm -hmm. feminism. Right. And, and they all believe completely mistakenly that they're going to go into the job world and be taken seriously and be able to raise children and and be paid well and have a family. They're really completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how to help. But I was sitting here thinking, maybe we could use intersectionality to show them what this is about. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And I would I would like to try that. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> this is really a situation which is very disturbing. Mm -hmm. So a question in the back. Yeah. Well, you know, I haven't thought about this before, but the, actually, um, Professor Carbato, you brought up um, Muslim um, internment.
government, and then um, Professor Rotonda, you brought up 9-11 um, being kind of the moment, and we put Muslimness in, or Arab Muslimness, or whatever you want to call it, in the Asian American racialization category. But I was thinking about the, the propagandic language around um, the fear of the Muslim Brotherhood taking <coughs> of Egypt and the institutionalization of Sharia law. And so when I was thinking about that, it was interesting because almost every Arab country, their law is derived from Islamic law. So it's already there, but what they're afraid of is Islamic banking. And they're afraid of Islamic banking because it's debt free and they can't, what would they do with IMF loans and all these other neoliberal tools? So I was kind of wondering how, you know, I, I didn't even think about it now, but how that Muslimness is anti-property because it's anti-debt. Like, I don't know how that could fit in racially, but I'm kind of wondering if any panels can riff off that. The overflow room can't hear this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the overflow room can't hear this question. Oh. So oh. there's a question about the extent to which the anti-Muslim sentiment might be understood as a way to actually um, uh, prevent certain kinds of uh, property claims. In other words, to what extent are arguments uh, against uh, Muslim arguments that are steeped in capitalism to the extent that uh, Islamic law um, facilitates certain kinds of debt regimes that are not really cognizable in an American democratic order? I'll take a shot. So anyone want to take a shot? I'll take a shot. Um, th in the variations that I was trying to work through about um, Asian American whiteness and notions of property, um, one of the hypotheticals that floated by um, in my mind uh, was notions of entitlement, and and you know as a dimension of uh, of uh, a dimension of property, uh, and the entitlement in the in this context that came to mind was what would happen if a Chinese aircraft carrier um, showed up off of Los Angeles Harbor uh, in international waters, in recognized international waters. Um, the idea that that, um, you know, the, the, we would go bonkers, right, because of, of some sense of entitlement uh, that it's okay for us to put our aircraft carriers um, mm -hmm. and, and putting aside using them, putting aside any bombs, just the very presence, um, carries with it uh, this whole expectation. And um, I was, the other hypothetical that I was trying to work through uh, is around Christian normativity, right? And I was thinking of the, um, I, I've been working on religion, and it's like been really, really <laughs> difficult, to say the least. Um, but the, the, uh, um, the football player who, who took a bow, uh, who took a prayer after a celebration, and of course, um, we have um, enshrined um, Tim Tebow into a noun. I mean, it's, it, it's the, the act has been enshrined. It, it, is, it has been reified into a, into a thing uh, and, and is saleable. I mean, it, it's a commodity that's available for, for use and reuse. Um, and it's all around Christian normativity and ex the expectations about what standards are permissible and possible. So m my suggestion is, and, and of course then to get into banking, IMF, um, we have to go back into sort of you know, inter-imperial conflict um, and all that stuff about um, what is China, what are China and Russia and maybe India really up to um, and the BRICS and all this kind of foreign policy, foreign finance, which just you know, boggles my, I, I always get glass, gl gloss over when I read this stuff. Um, but inter-imperial conflict is a direct, direct impact upon the lives of Asian Americans. You can just tr trace this steady, the d direct line all the way through uh, the conditions of lives of persons of Asian ancestry uh, going from the 19th century uh, with China, um, US, Japan, um, Pearl Harbor and Japanese internment uh, into China. I, I, the Wen Ho Lee was one of my examples of, uh, was an example that was part of that context. But um, expectational interests, um, so, some notion of finance, clearly it has something to do with property, but I couldn't retranslate it back into the theoretical forms that we're talking about here. Um, but they, th these are clearly susceptible to property analysis 
in, um, um, you know, in, in a, but require enormous care, enormous breadth of understanding and vision to be able to try and piece them through, which is why Cheryl Harris's work offers such a wonderful model, uh, because she did it. Um, and, and so uh, it's sort of like I regarded that, that's what I was thinking of as this methodological challenge. I think your intuition is sound. I think there's something there. Uh, and so it's up to you to go ahead and figure it out and write it for us. Right. <laughs> you know, I, let me just 